Well, good morning. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is so good to see you on this rainy, damp, yet glorious Sunday morning because Christ is risen and he's risen indeed. Uh, we have a few announcements this morning uh, I wanted to make you aware of. First, our Grief Share Grief Support Group will start this Tuesday, October 20th at 6 p.m. Um, if you know, if you yourself are grieving, have been grieving, have lost someone, uh, please come. Or if you know someone, please come. Just show up Tuesday at 6. Um, also, our Stephen Ministry is uh, reminding that you, if you're struggling with the pandemic, with exhaustion, pandemic fatigue, please reach out to one of our Stephen ministers and let somebody walk with you through this. Let someone be there and pray with you and point you to Christ. It's a wonderful ministry. You know, we can't do it alone. We can't face this pandemic alone. Also, Wednesday night, uh, our youth are having a worship service, which we will be live streaming Please tune in at 6 p.m. I am so proud of our youth and how hard that they have worked to put together this worship service and the messages these youth have for us as a congregation and for our world. They're not messages just on the youth's heart. I really believe God placed them on their heart. So I give thanks for the youth in this church and for Shannon and Sarah and all the youth leaders. So. Uh, we're going to live stream it at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night. Also, on the 28th, which is not this Wednesday, but next week, Wednesday, let me see if I can get this right, we're having Family Fire Pit Fellowship <laughs> and that, at 6 p.m. It's going to be outside. We do ask that each family bring their own food to consume, but it'll be a great time a fellowship, and I know it's been a long time since we've been able to be together. So that's Wednesday, October 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, also, we are collecting cake mix uh, for the Thanksgiving baskets. We need to collect 100. And I believe there's a box out in the front as you came in, if you, and they'll be there each Sunday. If you'd like to drop them off there, or you can drop them off at the office as well. Okay, I think that may be our announcement. Uh, this morning, we light a candle and we're praying for Purrier and Mason's Chapel United Methodist Church. So let us prepare our hearts to worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. In the eye of the storm. You remain in control In the middle of the war You got my soul You alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm Almighty loving God Lord, I pray that right now that each one here watching, each one of us gathered here and online, that we feel your love surround us and just hold us close. God, we come today to worship you, to proclaim your goodness. God, to give you thanks for the good work you're doing in us, the good work you've done for us, and God, to come and be prepared to be vessels for you to do work through us. Gracious God, we come and lay down the burdens of this past week, the sorrows, the tiredness, to be filled with you, to overflow with you for this next week as we go forth to be your hands and feet, no matter what we do. Gracious God, we pray for those who grieve. God, we pray that you are the God of all comfort, that you wrap them up, you just hold them close. 
and that you take their sorrow and fill them and fill them with your joy the kind of joy that scripture tells us is our strength for the joy of the Lord is my strength gracious God I pray for those of us anyone watching who may be struggling who may know deep down that they need someone to listen but God I pray you conquer any fear they may have God may you show them that you are there and that the way into the light sometimes is just saying the words having a listening ear a non-judgment listening ear and that they will reach out Gracious God, I thank you for our youth and our children of this church, for our youth and children's leaders and the passion you've placed in their heart. God, our children, our youth are not just the church of tomorrow, but they are the church of today. And God, scripture says that you speak through babes. And God, that is so often true. So continue to strengthen our children and youth leaders as they teach your children about you. And I just pray our children and youth continue to open their hearts to you, to serve you with excitement, to not only hear their faith, but to live it out. Gracious, loving God, we come and we pray for our sister churches, Perrier and Mason's Chapel. God, we pray that they continue the good work that you started. And we know they will because you will see that that good work comes to completion, that you strengthen them and they feel your presence this morning in their worship service. Gracious God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And would you please stand and join us? We sing, I saw the light. No more. 
scripture this morning comes from Paul's letters to the Philippians chapter 3 starting in verse 1 and going through verse 16 hear the word of our Lord so then my brothers and sisters be glad in the Lord it's no trouble for me to repeat the same things to you because they will help keep you on track Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for people who do evil things. Watch out for those who insist on circumcision, which is really mutilation. We are the circumcision. We are the ones who serve by God's Spirit and who boast in Christ Jesus. We don't put our confidence in rituals performed on the body, though I have good reason to have this kind of confidence. If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets, but I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have lost everything for Him. But what I lost, I think of as sewer trash so that I might gain Christ and be found in Him. In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith, the righteousness I have come from knowing Christ and the power of His resurrection and the participation in His sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already reached this goal or already have per been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. So all of us who are spiritually mature should think this way. And if anyone thinks differently, God will reveal it to him or her. Only let's live in a way that is consistent 
with whatever level we have reached. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now here's Miss Brittany with a message for our children. This church and welcome back to another children's time. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning as we um, dig in to the next part of finding um, out how we can be the light um, in the world. One way that we know that um, God wants a relationship with us and he pursues us, um, that's a big word for kids, but he is constantly wanting to love you and constantly wanting to be a part of your life. So I have a short video today that I wanna show you about how God pursues you. Psalm 139 is one of the most popular Psalms in the whole Bible. It was written by King David and it talks about how God pursues us before we pursue him. And here's our first point. God knows the real you. That means no matter how hard you try to disguise yourself, God still knows who you are. God knows us better than we even know ourselves. And the reason is simple. It's because he made us. Think about it. Who knows most about how bikes work? The bike maker. Duh. And who knows most about how kids work? The kid maker. God. Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart. And you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. <laughs> God knows everything. He knows the past, present, and future. And he knows your thoughts, your fears, and the things that bring you happiness. And here's the next thing. God is closer than you realize. Not only does God know everything, he is everywhere. He's always with us, everywhere we go. He will never leave us because he loves us. Psalm 139 again. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. And there's one more thing. God wants to be in your life. You weren't created by accident. God has a plan for your life. But you can't fulfill that purpose if you don't let God into your life to show you. God wants to be around you, but you have to invite him in. Have you done that, kids? Now why don't you talk about it with your parents or teacher? Do it. It's a good idea. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for these kids. I thank you for what they mean to us. I ask that you be with them and allow them to feel your presence in their lives, to know that you are there with them and guiding them along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning we are starting, uh, continuing our sermon series, Prepare to Shine. And this morning we're on part two, Prepare to Pursue. If you remember our overarching verse for the sermon series is John 12, 36. A, as long as you have the light, believe in the light so that you might become people whose lives are determined by the light. Uh, and last week we talked about preparing to proclaim hope. And I talked about how we had to get more detailed. We had to get beyond the just Jesus loves you. Yes, that's true. But we need to be so detailed that we could tell people 
how we know Jesus loves us, how we have experienced the love of Jesus. And I am so thankful and so proud of this church. Um, our, some of our years took it upon themselves to get detailed. They took, you can, the slide please, they took some of their favorite scriptures. This is, this is Benton First United Methodist Youth. They took some of their favorite scriptures and they got detailed so that they could explain to those they came into contact with, not just say that this scripture says this, but they could go further and explain the hope of that scripture. Church, what an amazing youth group God is forming here. And I'm so happy too in the church because I also said we should turn our shoulds and see the things that we say we should do as what God's calling us to do. And I know many of you have done that because some of your shoulds have involved me or you've been gracious enough to call me and say, you know what, God's really saying I should go visit this person and I think you should go with me. <laughs> and I think I always said yes this week. I was blessed I was able to. So church, I am so thankful for each and every one of you for your willingness to do the work to prepare to shine. Well, today we're going to talk about preparing to pursue. We do the pursuing. Well, you may ask, well, what are we pursuing? Today we're talking about preparing to pursue holiness, preparing to pursue the kingdom of God, preparing to pursue people, the lost, and maybe, just maybe, chasing after a God-given vision for our lives personally, but also for our church, for us, the body of Christ. You know, Paul starts off our scripture today, and he says, be glad. Be glad. And he goes, it's no problem for me. I'll tell you two or three times. And if you read Paul's letters, that's one of his themes. Rejoice always. Give thanks to the Lord. I'll say it again. Be glad. Did y'all get the rest of that? Because that is what keeps you on track. That's what he says. It's our joy in the Lord that keeps us on track. That keeps us in the race. That keeps us pursuing. You know, Nehemiah 8.10 it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, if you go back and you read Nehemiah 8 and 9, the people aren't, have no reason really to be happy. In fact, they're not really actually happy. They're actually mourning, complaining. And do you know that God tells Nehemiah, get the people to worship. That's what's going to strengthen them. So in chapter 9, they do worship. And part of that worship is kind of like what we talked about last week. They recalled everything that God had done for them and in their lives. And that brought them joy, the joy of the Lord, to be their strength. To be their strength. You know, it kind of reminds me, I don't know if it's an old or Sunday school song or not. I learned it when I was little. So you be the judge. But it reminds me of the Sunday school song. Uh, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Thank you. <laughs> I was beginning to think I was the only person. I was like, oh. But there's something. You know, that's a cute song that we sing with kids. But that's where our hope is, is when we can put the joy, joy down in our heart. That's what strengthens us to pursue, no matter the conditions on the outside, to continue the pursuit of holiness in God's kingdom and the pursuit of people, even when we're having to climb a mountain, even when the road is rocky. So that's why Paul tells the Philippians, be glad or give thanks in every circumstance. 
Because that's what keeps you in the race, is the joy of the Lord. It's holding on to the Lord, reminding yourself of what the Lord has done in your life, how you've seen God work in other people's lives, the way he's worked in Scripture, and putting your sole source of joy in him. Letting you the source of your joy be Christ alone. You know what? People are great. I love people. But people, we cannot depend on people to be the source of our ultimate joy. We can't do it. Because people, even the greatest people we know, if we follow them long enough, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to let us down. If we put people up on a pedestal, they're going to fall off sooner or later. It's the nature of human beings. It's the nature of the world we live in. So people are great, but and people can bring us joy. Our children bring us joy. Our spouses bring us joy. Our friends bring us joy. But the ultimate source of joy that we have to hold on to in order to pursue is the Lord, is Christ. And we do that by celebrating who Christ is and what he's done and what he's doing now, what he's going to do. So Paul says, rejoice. And then in our scripture, it's like Paul was writing something, then he's like, oh, I forgot something, or he completely went sidetracked. None of you ever do that, right? None of you ever get sidetracked. And he says this statement, he goes, Watch out for the dogs. Yeah. Paul could probably wrote a song, Watch Out for the Dogs. Who, who? But, <laughs> you know, reading scripture is never boring, let me just say. So you have this weird phrase, Watch out for the dogs. And Paul repeats, Watch out three times. So he is stressing it. And the people he's warning the Philippians about are people who are trying to teach that you have to become Jewish, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You know, Paul talks about in his other letters that the only circumcision that really matters is circumcision of the heart. And he says, that, and he's talking about people who trust in their own credentials in order to be saved. And Paul goes on to say, you know, if, if we could be saved by credentials, I would be first in line. You know, Paul says, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I became a Pharisee. I was zealous for the law. That, I mean, I studied the law day and night. I would spend time, I would think about every aspect of my life and figure out if, how to keep from breaking the law. I mean, honestly, Paul probably even had it figured out how to sneeze properly. Probably even knew how to breathe right. And he was zealous for the law. He was so zealous, he even persecuted the church. Paul said, if anyone has anything to boast in, anyone has any reason to boast in their credentials, their birthright, or anything else, it's me. It's me. If anyone has reason to boast in the flesh, Paul does. But that's it. Those things are just of the flesh. And the flesh is in opposition to those who live by the Spirit. Paul then moves into the talk of a profit and gain. And he says, the things that I lost are like sewer trash compared to what I gained in Christ. My education, my power, my ranking. I consider all those Sewer trash. Let me tell you, 
the problem going from Greek to English oftentimes is that there's not a word in English that is a really good fit for the Greek word used. And let me tell you, to get the real meaning of the word that was translated sewer this morning, pretty sure the translator was just trying to think of a polite word you could say in church. That's what Paul thought of all he had before Christ. The power, the degrees. Paul wasn't hurting for food, let's put it that way. But when he came to know Christ, he said, that stuff is just trash. He gave it away. So that couldn't compare to knowing Christ. To putting his full abiding faith in Jesus the Christ. Now Paul, when he talks about faith, he talks about four words. Faith, trust, belief, and faithfulness. And you and I, we love the happy side of faith, as I call it. The positive side of faith. We love the part of faith where we receive Jesus. We receive forgiveness of sins. We are brought into the kingdom of God. We are God's child. But what we don't often talk about within church, within our studies, may be what could be considered the tough side of faith or the negative side of faith, where faith calls you to give up something, where faith in Christ cause you to renounce your former way of life, the former things you put your hope in. Yes, there's a happy, yes, I received Jesus, but faith also recalls us to put our trust alone in Christ and to let go of the things that we used to put our trust so much in. A question to you this morning what, what's keeping you from fully embracing your faith in Christ? What are you still holding on to and still trusting in? You know, so often, and I don't know how we get it when we read Scripture, so often we think, we tell ourselves that if we attend church on Sunday morning, if we, tend, if we live by morals and principles, God must really owe us something. So if I do this, 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 God will shower me with blessings. There's even TV evangelists I know that preach that. But there's nothing in Scripture that says that. Yeah, you know, we have in our Scripture today... Paul saying, talking about sharing in the suffering of Christ. Yes, Christ died and rose again on the third day, but Christ suffered. And maybe the challenge this week, part of the challenge, is for us to go back and maybe start in like John chapter 12 and read through the rest of John and read through the suffering of Christ. Maybe we should read through it often. More than just one time of year at Easter. So that when that creeps in, well, God, I've been good. Why is this happening? We can remember Jesus' words that, remember, if the world hates you, it hated me first. Or no servants above their master. If, you're, if you did it to me, they'll do it to you. But Paul again says, I count everything a loss, and I even suffer because I know the prize which I pursue. The prize of to know Jesus in his resurrection. And when you're baptized, you say, everything else doesn't matter. In fact, you almost kind of say, my life as it is doesn't matter. Because when you die and you're risen to new life in Christ, and that's what matters. 
So then you start a pursuit of holiness. So today, I invite us to prepare to pursue. And one of the things we're going to pursue is holiness. And guess what? It isn't just an hour a week pursuit. And it's not a sprint. It's more like an eternal marathon. Lifelong marathon with eternal implications, really. So how do we pursue holiness? That means growing in our relationship with Christ. That means growing in Christ-likeness. And what we, God has given us gifts to do such that. You know, we know them as spiritual disciplines. Now, if you train for anything, you prepare, you work, you discipline yourself. Well, it's the same way in growing in a relationship with Christ, growing in Christ's likeness. We have disciplines that help us on our relationship with Christ. You know, such disciplines, and we'll talk more about them later in probably another sermon series, but um, such disciplines as meditation, prayer, scripture study, Fasting, fasting for spiritual purposes and not for power or for vanity, but for to be closer to God. You know, the best way you can read so many books on these spiritual disciplines, the best way to get better at them is to do them. You know, like when we pray, prayer is something probably we all do. But what if this week in our prayers, we did only 30% of the talking and 70% of listening? See, I think sometimes that's the part we forget. We tell God everything we want, need. We lift up people. Then we say, gotta go. What if your friend did that to you? You probably wouldn't think they're much of a friend. So spend time listening. Or let your prayer simply be, God, here I am. I'm listening. But we've got to pursue our growth in Christ to go on to maturity. And Paul here, he's certain, he's, whatever level you're at, it's okay because God meets you there. And God can grow you from there. Says, But don't stop. Pursue it. Yes, it's work. But also, one of the spiritual dis, uh, disciplines is service. That's pursuing the kingdom of God. Do you know the kingdom of God has less to do with buildings and places we go when we die? And it has more to do with people? People. It has more to do with people. Scriptures tell us that our bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is living in us, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same power that can conquer death now lives in us. So you and I, as we grow in holiness, we can become places where heaven and earth meet, thin places. You know, when Jesus was here, I, I challenge you to read Matthew the next couple weeks. And just every time you see the words kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, write it down and look what Jesus says about it. Because that's the most thing, that's the one thing that Jesus talked most about was repent. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. Change your hearts and lives. Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God than he did love. And it's so, you know, it almost kind of uh, sounds funny. There's a place in Mark, people are looking for the kingdom, and Jesus is standing right next to him, and Jesus says, you're near the kingdom of God. And I just imagine him smiling, because I think the kingdom of God is where Jesus is at. So if we get serious about pursuing the kingdom of God, what does Matthew 25 tell us? Where does Jesus at? Where do we find Jesus? 
Somehow we find Jesus in the hungry and the sick and those in prison in the naked. Probably people in you and I left to our own devices. Don't tend to gravitate towards. But we can't do that if we're pursuing the kingdom of God. And maybe that's what we need to ask ourselves. You remember, they're called Judaizer. You remember those I was talking about who tried to say, you know, you had to be circumcised in order to be saved? It's almost like they like their in and out policy. Well, my question to us this morning, whether we know it or not, do we have an in and out policy? Do we have an ideal of who we would like in our church and who we like, ah, oh, not so much? Yeah, I had a conversation, not with here, but in the past, a gentleman came to me and said, you know, we really, this person would be a good member of our church. And it really just blew my mind. Because I, all I can think is, what constitutes a good church member? And I know, I know what this person meant. He meant a worker, clean, and a giver. But that's the church functioning as a club and not the church. So we have to ask ourselves, and this is between us and God, but do we ask the Holy Spirit, say, do I tend, God, show me if I think, if there's any part of me that might say, I don't want that person in the church because of this. And then let God deal with you, all of us. Because scripture says that Jesus died for all. You know, 1 Timothy tells us that God desires all to come to know him, all to be saved. And when you read the gospel, the ones who respond to the kingdom of God being near are the outcast. So as we pursue the kingdom and we pursue people, our hearts have to be going after all people for the kingdom. N.T. Wright, he said that the world could cope with a Jesus that stayed in the grave and was just a great ideal in the minds of his disciples. And I read that and I thought, you know what? Some days, if I'm honest, that's what I want to cope with. And if we're honest, church, that's the kind of Jesus we like to cope with. One that just kind of remains inward, our own thing, kind of almost like our Jesus hobby. But that's not what happened. The world cannot cope. And we who profess Christ, we have to cope. We've got to get better. But the world cannot cope with a Jesus who rolled back the tomb and walked out of it and started bringing his kingdom here on earth, his new kingdom right in the middle of the old kingdom. I said all were invited. So we pursue holiness, pursue the kingdom, and we pursue people. We pursue people. What did Jesus say? Go and make disciples. That means we have to go, and they're not going to, they're probably not going to come to us. I'm afraid to say the days of going to church on Sunday morning, because that's what everybody did, are probably getting lesser and lesser probably disappearing altogether, honestly. So we have to go to them. We go to those who, yeah, I know about church. I've just, I've just started to really enjoy my sleep or, no, Sunday's my only day off. We go to them, but we go to also those whose hearts are raw, those who 
may never maybe heard about Jesus once. Maybe they know Jesus loves me. And we may think we live in the Bible Belt. But, and I thought that for a while too. But there are kids, there are people who do not know about Jesus. Who, there are households where the word Jesus is never spoken. You and I, there are kids who go there many of their days without ever hearing the word Jesus. Well, maybe if they do, it's not the way you should hear Jesus. And we have to pursue, prepare to pursue them as well. Because they have an invitation to the kingdom of God. Jesus wants to work in them for holiness. And then as we pursue, pray that God gives us a vision. Proverbs says where there's no vision, the people perish. I pray that we start seeing what God is calling our church to be. What our church could be. What God wants our church to be. To dream big. And maybe pray about what part each of us play in that vision. Yeah. I, I don't have it printed today, but I'll probably email it just out. If you want it, I've made a study note, sort of. Things to help us think through all these topics and questions I'm raising so that we can prepare to shine. So your, our invitation today is to prepare to pursue, to pursue holiness by growing in Christ-likeness, to pursue the kingdom of God, to find, follow Jesus in our world, to pursue people and catch a glimpse of a vision, a Christ-given vision for our church that we keep before us as we run. Are you ready to pursue church? Say yes. Well, let's put our running shoes on, lace them up tight. Let's remind each other of the joy in the Lord and point each other to the Christ. And let's pursue. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today. Lord, we hear your challenge to pursue holiness, to pursue growth in you, in your image, in your likeness, to put our faith and confidence along in you, to let go of the other stuff that we hold so desperately to. Holy Spirit, we pray that you work in our lives to knock down the barriers that we keep. And God, that we may pursue your kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we know that Jesus Christ came out of that tomb and is living and working even in the midst of this broken, sinful world we live in. And God, you're or our strength when we run the race. God, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to work in us. That this week as we go about, we see all the people that we come in contact to, with. Whether it's our co-workers, our family, the person next to us in the red light. And God, make us stop and pray for that person. Pray for their heart. And God, could help us see people and pray for them. And God, not stop there, but if we feel your nudging, help us to be intentional to reach out, even if it's not what we would usually do. Gracious God, our hearts desire is to do your will, to be your hands and feet. So Lord, we surrender our lives to you. And Lord, make us shine. Help us prepare to shine. So we can, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Make us be that bright in our community so that those can find hope. The hurting can find healing. 
and the lost shall be found. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand now and join us for our closing song this morning? Give me faith. pursue holiness grow, go and grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ go and put his kingdom before you go after all the people you see let Christ lead God and direct us and his peace always be with us amen <laughs>